So while we're waiting for that to go live, everybody type in and let me know what your biggest takeaway from our first session was. I got some from the free Facebook group. People posted in there. Um, but let me know what your biggest takeaway was. Pop that into the group. Awesome. Make a website. People saying that we're, yeah, you're called to serve. You absolutely are. Wendy says her biggest takeaway was I can do it. Fantastic. Yeah. It's super important to have an online presence. I, it, I cannot emphasize that enough. Very, very, very important. Yeah, Sue says responsibility. That is a biggie, and it's one I feel super strongly about. So if you weren't here for the first one, what they were talking about is that I talked about one of the reasons that everybody needs to think about sharing their art, whatever way you define success, that there are people out there who need to see your paintings, and you don't know necessarily how you're gonna impact them, in what way you're gonna impact them, but there are people who need to see your gifts. Not even talking about selling, just it, seeing it. And if you hold that back, you're not living up to your responsibility as an artist who's been given a gift. So everybody think about that one and hold on to that one. If you missed the first video, be sure to go back to the replay page, to the directory page and watch that one. Super important parts in there. So what we talked about in video one was about the fact that the old school approach to having an impact with your work, to selling your work, doesn't work anymore. It's broke, as we say here in the South. So it's a broken system. And when you are taught that the way forward as an artist is first off to go out there, get into shows, and then find a gallery, you're setting yourself up for some real heartache, frustration, and pain, because that's not the first place to start. And we talked about a bunch of the reasons why it's not. The decreasing attendance at galleries and live events. The fact that it takes so many eyeballs on your work in order to make a sale, that the average conversion rate is 2%, which means you've got a, one in 50 is gonna buy. So you gotta have 50 people actually walk through that door in a gallery or an art fair in order to have one sale. That translates into online as well, but it's a whole lot easier to get the numbers online than it is at a live event. So the solution is to develop your own online pathway. And that's the Thriving Artist Roadmap. So how did I come to that? So I, I created the roadmap for myself first. And I started developing it back in the late 2000s as the economy started going, doo -doo 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 -doo. Um, I had been showing in galleries for a long, long time at that point. I had a full-time job at a college here in the Southeast and was teaching painting, had been for 20-something years at that point. But I noticed a lot of changes happening. Galleries were closing. And in 2010, almost nobody made any sales, myself included. All of my friends had really horrible years, and that was nationwide, worldwide, really. And galleries across the world closed down. My own main gallery struggled to make it through. He did, because he's a really smart dealer, but it was touch and go there for quite a while. So there's some real challenges there. And I also watched colleges and universities struggle. So I felt really uncomfortable relying for all of my income from physical galleries and a physical teaching facility. That made me feel really stressed. So I worked really hard to build out another channel for my artwork. And I think you might remember that I talked about really having three legs for your stool to survive as a thriving artist. I've preached that ever since I first started teaching artists, young artists to begin with at the college, how to create a thriving career. 
You need to have three legs to your stool. Don't ever depend on one income source. So my two main ones felt real wobbly. So I started doing the research and digging into what it took to go online, to take my business online and reach an audience that wasn't limited by being where my galleries were or where my studio was or the single teaching institution that I was at. And I followed a couple of other artists who were real pioneers and then mimicked some of the things that they do and threw away some of the things that just didn't work for me. And the steps that I took, there was a lot of trial and error, and quite frankly, some of it just didn't work. And I don't want you all to have to go through that. So we're going to talk today about what those five steps are that I came up with that have worked gangbusters for me and made it so that I could leave the college and go full time in the studio back in the spring, April of 2016, almost four years now. So those five steps, those five key steps to thriving as an artist are first mindset. Y'all remember that? Um, so the first step is mindset. You got to have the thriving artist mindset. You got to get past some of those limiting beliefs. And I want you to notice where I have that positioned. And hopefully y'all can see this flipped around in the video. But mindset is right here at the center. It's not just step one. It is the heart of your thriving artist's practice. Without it, you're not going to succeed. And there are a whole list of fears and things that come up for people that get in the way of their thriving as an artist. The second step and we're going to go back through all of these. And I've also got a little Cersei for y'all. So sidetrack, rabbit hole. Who knows what a Cersei is? Anybody in the, in the chat roll? Anybody who's here live today know what a Cersei is? I know my students do, and some of them are here. Yes, exactly. Cerseys are South Carolinian for a surprise gift, a little surprise present. So it's what we call a, a little unexpected gift or, pre, gift or present. So I've got a PDF for y'all that has this laid out in it with the different steps along the way. So while I want y'all to take notes and write stuff down because we remember what we write down, I've got a PDF version of this for you that I'm going to send out with the, the replay link. So got a gift for you at the end. So. In the center is mindset. Artwork comes next. It's foundational. And you got to have artwork in order to thrive as an artist. No art, no artist practice. I'm going to talk a little bit more about what kind of art too in just a minute. Then you got to have a platform. Now, in the old way of doing things, after you got your artwork, after you created the thriving mindset and got your artwork, then you went to hunt for somebody else to provide a platform for you. You went to find a gallery, you went to find an art fair, you went to find an outdoor event, somebody else's platform. But remember, the big problem with that is it's not yours, you don't own it and you don't control it. And it's got really limited traffic. When you own the platform, then you can control the traffic and you can get the eyeballs in there to see your work, i.e. there's no gatekeeper. And galleries and art fairs and exhibitions and outdoor events are gatekeepers. They let some people in and they keep other people out. But the reality is, remember back, I talked about this on Monday, every last one of y'all has something right now that you need to share with the world. And there's no gatekeeper holding you back other than yourself and your own fears. More on that in a minute. So the platform is how you share that. It's your online platform. It's got several key parts. We're going to come back to that. That's what we're mainly going to focus on today. Then you need an audience. The platform helps you develop your audience. Remember I talked about the person who had a website but hadn't had any sales and was going to give up? And the, she didn't need to give up 
She had a website, but what she was missing was this and this. So having a website is not enough. Websites are part of your platform. Your email list and your social media hub is the other part. But that's what you use to build this, the audience. The audience, those are your perfect people. Not everybody in the world, but the people who are in your niche. The people who love the things you love. The people who care about the same things you care about. And the people who are going to be attracted to your work. So that's what your niche is. So the audience is super important. Just having them, signing them up is not enough. Got to build a relationship with them. That's a new idea for a lot of people. And it can feel awkward at first, but it is extraordinarily rewarding. So the key here is to build a relationship with them. And you can do that with that platform over here. Once you've built a relationship, then you can use your sales mechanism. And there are a whole lot of different ways to sell. But you can use your sales mechanism to share your work with them and receive the money that will then allow you to go buy more paint, to pay for your food, and to pay for your rent, and all of the other things that are necessities for living. But that relationship is key here. So we're going to go through each of these kind of quickly, and then I'm going to land on here on the platform part and talk about that a good bit today. Friday, we're going to spend a lot of time on audience. Next Monday, all about the sales mechanism, all about how you get this, this to here. Because the sales mechanism, notice it's in between the artwork and the audience. That's how you get the artwork to the audience. So everybody with me so far? Cool. And Laura says, there's a shop in Charleston that spells it Circe. Yeah, some people spell it S-U-R-C-I-E and some people spell it S-U-R-C-E-E. -E. Same deal. It's really, it's not just South Carolinian. It's low country South Carolinian. So Circe's are an awesome thing. So I want to, let me see if I can pull up really quickly here, my first part of that. Let's look at mindset first. Mindset is not just having positive thoughts all the time. Nobody has positive thoughts all the time. It's not humanly positive, possible to have positive thoughts all the time. But there are some definite thoughts that will get in your way if you want to be a thriving artist. And one of them that I have heard, I don't know how many times, and it's usually the, one of the first things out of people's mouths when they, I'm consulting with them is that they say artists just can't make money selling their artwork. It's just not possible. Nobody buys paintings. That, my friends, is simply not true. Because if nobody bought paintings, then we wouldn't have all of those online platforms that are doing super, super well. And we wouldn't have an art market whose con contribution to the economy is as high as it is. A corollary to that is that people believe that they can't sell their art unless they are in New York. They gotta be in a certain place, like New York, LA, Paris, some special place. Well, with the internet, that's not true. So you have to let go of that belief. It's a false one. In fact, I'm going to call out, I'm not going to say which one of my students, but I, bunches of my students recently, um, because we were talking about this very thing, were saying, well, I can't sell my paintings very easily because I live in the middle of nowhere and there are no galleries around me. What's wrong with that statement? Anybody know? Pop the answer into the, the 
the box there if you know what the the problem with that statement was so what she said was i can't yeah L, everything exactly thank y'all your galleries on your computer and now you have the internet and galleries are not your first place to go to sell that's the hardest spot to sell in so the problem with that one is she just needed to reframe it because and she knows that it's just that those belief systems are so drilled into us that we have a hard time letting them go so even when you know it up here it's hard to get it in your gut and in your heart but you got to say it to yourself often enough and you got to look at how many successful artists are out there selling their work online without a gallery one of my favorites to talk about is ashley longshore now, Ashley Longshore lives in New Orleans. Anybody follow her? Yeah, somebody saying, be your own gallery. Carson says, Deborah on Facebook says, be your own gallery. Absolutely right. Ashley Longshore is a New Orleans artist and she does, is not represented by another gallery, hasn't been. She has her own gallery now, physical gallery, but for a long time, she just sold on Instagram and her website and her paintings sell for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. She has multiple assistants. She travels around the country, around the world. I think right now she has a contract with, I know Tommy Hilfinger, and figure, I always mispronounce his last name. And, um, Donna Coran, I'm gonna say the wrong designer. Anyway, she's working with three or four designers, creating both installations for their, their lines, as well as designing some clothes, helping them design some clothes. So she has branched out tremendously. She had her own temporary gallery in one of the major department stores. She sells regularly on Instagram. We're going to talk about her sales mechanism on Monday. Doesn't need a gallery. Thrives as an artist. I know a little bit about her because one of my nieces works for her, and so does the daughter-in-law of a friend of mine. Very, very, very successful artist. You can follow her on Instagram. She's got an interesting mouth. Be prepared for that. But she also has an enormous heart another artist who thrives purely online james jean who is also a painter no physical gallery i think he sometimes creates his own paints enormous large huge paintings that sell out really quickly there are a number of examples of artists that do that any number of examples of artists who do that so to think that you can't make any money from selling your art is just a false belief you have to let go of. It's part of that starving artist mindset. How many of you were ever told when you talked about wanting to be an artist, you shouldn't do that. You won't ever make any money. You'll starve to death. Anybody else ever hear that when they were growing up? Type that in there. It's James Jean, Claire. It's James G G James J E A N <coughs> James Jean. It's a man. And the other person was Ashley Longshore. I'm going to send y'all links to their work in the follow-up email. So don't worry too much about getting the spelling right, because I think it's a whole lot easier to find them if you can just click on a link. <coughs> so I'm going to give y'all examples of a few, a couple of different people who are really, really doing outstandingly online. So yeah, Paula says, my mom called it homemade crap. Ugh. Um, I used to get that from parents a lot as a college art professor. I would be sitting down to talk with parents who'd come into the office and they were looking at colleges and it would be just a little while before I'd get that sheepish look from a, a mom or a dad who would turn and go, so tell me the truth, is my child gonna starve? And the truth is, you don't have to, but 
that is a, pre a prevailing myth within our culture. My own father worried about that. And my mother was an artist, but my dad was a scientist. And for him, the idea of going into art full time looked too risky. He later came back and said, you know, I was so wrong. I, I eat my words. So he, he was, uh, um, had a lot of gumption to come back and say, sorry, I was bad. I was wrong. You did the right thing. But a lot of parents don't do that. So that gets drilled into us and it takes a while to get rid of it. What gets rid of it is the first time you hear PayPal go ping and a painting salt. Once that happens, it is so easy to let go of that myth because then you know you have the power, you have the control, you can do this. So another fear that I hear, another myth that I hear a lot is that artists who sell their art are selling out. That somehow selling your work is dirty and bad. And I don't think that could be further from the truth. Just go back to what we talked about on Monday about the impact that your work can have on other people way beyond the monetary impact. And the truth is, we deserve to be able to eat. I'm not sure why people think that artists have to starve when they don't think that doctors and lawyers do. So we deserve to eat, we deserve to have clothes on our backs, we deserve to be able to drive a car just like any other profession. Just because you're an artist does not doom you to be a starving artist at all. So eliminate that belief system. And if somebody is telling it to you a whole lot, you just have to kind of go like this and stick your fingers in your ears. When I first left my job, my full-time job, I caught a lot of grief from really well-meaning friends, some of my best friends about how, how could I possibly leave a full-time job where I was secure? A, I wasn't secure. No job where you're working for somebody else is totally secure. That's an illusion. But it punched all of their buttons is what the reality was. So people will tell you things that are really their own fears. You don't have to take those fears on. Another one that I hear is I'm too old or I'm too young. I live in the wrong place, fill in the blank with whatever else the physical attribute is. I had a really good friend, she passed away a year and a half ago, who um, was the age of my parents. And she was a fantastic role model. She'd painted her whole life raised a family of children by herself after her husband died by running the city's um, art and recreation program. When she, and she showed intermittently, sold the occasional painting, but she didn't have time and there weren't the mechanisms at that point to do anything um, beyond the standard go to New York. There were no real galleries in Columbia. And it wasn't until she retired from that job at 65, started painting full time, and exhibiting with the same gallery that I was in, that she was able to make more money than she'd ever made in her life. At 65, she started. One of her biggest paintings sold for over $30,000. She was the top seller, I think she actually still is, the top seller in the gallery started at 65. It's never too late. And as somebody put into the chat roll just now, Grandma Moses. And in fact, if you're an older woman, you're in a really good spot because there is an enormous amount of attention being paid in the art world to work by women right now. It hadn't always been that way, but it is right now. So she started her career at 65 without any real problems her career took off. But part of what she was doing, and this leads us to our next step in there, she was showing up every day. 
she had a studio space where she showed up at nine o'clock in the morning, most of the time at 830. And she didn't leave until four or 430. Now, as she got older, she would come in at 930 and leave at 330. But she painted all day. Not everybody can do that. But the point I'm making here is that she painted on a regular basis. She didn't treat it as something where she's waiting around for inspiration to tap her on the head. She got down to work. That is how you make outstanding stellar paintings that are magnetic and draw your audience in, that are compelling, that emotionally touch other people. They don't have to be perfect paintings but they do have to be compelling. And when you show up every day and you're painting from your passion, then it's a whole lot easier to make those compelling paintings. So you need to show up. How many people have a regular painting practice already? Raise your hand. Type in yes in the comment box. If you don't, there are ways to get that started. Drop me an email, we'll figure that out. But there are absolutely simple solutions to that. It does not have to be go sign up for a $500 course. It is something you can do in your studio starting tomorrow. So yeah, I see some people saying not quite yet. And yes, intermittently. Yeah, sometimes. Yes, awesome. As long as you set that intention, you can step into that new routine or habit. But it's got to become a habit. Don't let these fears that I'm out, gonna outline right now get in your way. So, see, I have a list of them right here because I asked people, some of you may be on here, I asked people in the group, what gets in your way? Because I wanna know what people's real fears and problems are so we can dissolve those right now. So, the first one, and I actually did a whole blog post on this not too long ago is, and I don't think y'all can read this unless I pull it right up there, no one buys work in the style I paint in. Well, that's not true. There is a market out there for every single style that an artist can create. That's what I'm talking about when I talk about a niche. There is not one single style that is the only style that sells. Because the truth is, there are multiple art worlds. There's not one single art world. There's the New York contemporary art world, and that may or may not be for you. But there's also the world, for example, of equestrian art. There's the world of traditional equestrian art. There's the world of contemporary equestrian art. I have several students who work in, in that niche. I have one that paints more contemporarily, and I have several that paint more traditionally. They're in separate niches. That's how far down into the niche hole you can go. So there is a market for every single kind of painting that's out there. It can be by subject. It can be by style. It can be by medium. There's a market for watercolor paintings that's very different from oil paintings. There's a market for encaustics that's very different from watercolor. So there's a, a, a definite range of niches. You just have to figure out which one you fit in to find your perfect people. So that was definitely not true. And I'm going to share my screen here just for a second. And I'm going to take y'all on a little trip. We're going to go on a little road trip here because we're going to go over to Saatchi and we're going to look at the range of different styles that Saatchi Art sells. So hang tight for just a second. I'm gonna share my screen for just about two minutes. And we're gonna look at that whole range. Oh, way pop up. Okay, here we are at Saatchi. Now, Saatchi is a commercial platform. It's an online platform. There is a Saatchi Gallery in London but this is a separate business. Everything on here is sold online. And I want you to look up at the top and it's all by big general categories. 
painting cell, photography cells, drawing cell. Now, a lot of people think they can't sell their drawings. Yes, you can. Sculpture and prints. Now, they're talking about original prints here, not reproductions. All of these things sell. Limited editions are those reproductions, are those collections that are, are copies of the original artwork. So under paintings, let's just go to one of those categories. Look at all of these. We've got style, we've got fine art, abstract, modern, street art, pop art, and that's just general style. Then under subject, we've got portrait, landscape, still life, nature, beach, and then by medium. So for any of you who are math majors, you know that we then have a really enormous range of possibilities there. We have five cubed, at least. Correct me if I'm wrong. Math was not, I was good at math, but not my total big strong point. We've got an enormous range of possibilities there for a niche. So if we just go to painting and look at all of those different things, we can really narrow it down. I'm going to go back to my equestrian example. We want something more modern. And under subjects, I want horse. And then I can go even further into that niche. I can go down to watercolor. Look at all that are right here in this really very narrow niche. It's wide open. There are 25 results per page and there are more than three pages. It keeps going to page nine. There is a lot out there. Your niche needs to be narrow, but there are plenty of your perfect people out there, whatever your niche is. We're gonna be doing some of these for actual individual people over the course of the next couple of weeks. So we're gonna do our first one tomorrow. So the people who submitted their names for figuring out their niche on Monday, we're gonna be pulling out some of those and get started with some of those tomorrow on Thursday. Not at the same time, I'm gonna be doing those in the free Facebook group. So I'll be putting info about that on the replay email, but it is not that hard to narrow down your niche when you go from the work niche, from your business niche, to then find your perfect people. So that is how many different niches are out there. And that's just within painting. So had to share that because I think it's a whole lot more impressive when you see something yourself right in front of you that contradicts what somebody else is telling people. Now, what led to that in the Facebook group, what brought it up was that somebody who was teaching abstract painting told one of the members of the group that the only kind of artwork that was selling was abstract work. And that's just not true. You just saw that range there on Saatchi art. They're not gonna show work that's not gonna sell. They're not gonna feature it in the first selections that pop up on the website. Sandra, I'm gonna give you the link to the free Facebook group and it's gonna, I'll put it in the email as well. It's on the replay page. So if you go to the replay page, it's on that right hand side. There's a link to the free Facebook group. So you can definitely dive in there. Um, yeah, I'll talk about the difference in the prints um, in a little bit, Susan. I'll talk about that when we get to the Q&A part. So that fear that you can't sell your particular style is not grounded in reality. I just showed you that that's not true. All of the different styles sell. So um, another one that I get a lot, my work isn't good enough yet. How many of you have told yourself that? My work isn't good enough yet. When is yet gonna happen? When is yet going to occur? 
what has to happen for yet to take place. Because the truth is your work will never be perfect. My work's not perfect. No artist's work is perfect. We're all on a journey. And again, if you wait for your work to be perfect, you'll never share it and you'll never show it. Again, there's an audience out there for your work at whatever stage it's at. Now, does that mean you should not work on improving your work? No. We should all be working on improving our work all the time, working to make it more compelling, working to make it have more connection with our audience. But there's not an end point that you arrive at that's the time where now you start showing your work. If you wait, what are the consequences? What happens if you wait to show your work? What do y'all think would happen if you waited until tomorrow, next year, 10 years down the road? If you wait, what will happen? Yeah, life will pass you by, as Ann Davis says. Absolutely, you'll never do it because you'll keep telling yourself that you need to wait till tomorrow until it's better. And as Gwen says, and this is a reality. Now, Gwen is saying at my age, that's not an option. And I'm gonna say at any age, that's not an option. Nobody promises us tomorrow. We have a habit of putting off what we want to do until tomorrow, but there's no promise of tomorrow. All we've got is now. And now is when you need to do things, not tomorrow, now. So don't wait, do it now. Yeah, and as Casey says, just because you are showing doesn't mean you have to stop improving. You should always be improving. You should definitely always be doing that, but you do not need to wait until your work is better in air quotes. There's no little checklist that you go down and go, well, yeah, it's doing this, 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 and this. Now I can show it because if you do that, you will never show it. So my work isn't good enough is one that needs to go bye-bye as well. Here's another one that I get a lot of. I, oops, sorry. I don't have a series of work yet. Any of y'all in that boat? You feel like you don't have a series of work yet? Well, guess what? A corollary to that is I don't have a style yet. Your style happens with time, with a paintbrush. I was looking over to see if I had one next to me in hand or a paint knife. It's not going to happen by reading a book. It's not going to happen by watching a video. It happens by sitting down, if that's whether you paint, or standing up at the easel and doing the painting. So style will happen. A series will happen. There is no way to stop that other than to not paint. But in the meantime, there's no reason not to show your work. Even if you're not ready to sell it yet, you can start showing it. People love to watch somebody on a journey. And when you share that journey authentically, you can build a fantastic relationship with a group of raving fans who will cheer you along the way. But if you wait for that work to be perfect, you're not gonna show your work at all. When I first started showing my work online, I piddled around with my, my blog for a while. I had an email list that I was really irregular with. I think I, I started my email list in 2009 when uh, 2008 when I was doing a Kickstarter project to get an etching press and I just tinkered with it irregularly for about two years and it wasn't until I really started my daily painting project that I got serious about posting regularly on my website and about emailing my list of friends and family at that point. And you don't want to wait that long. You want to go on and get started. It's that showing up part of the process that's important. And when I started my daily painting project, I gave myself a challenge 
to use a tool that I was not used to painting with. I'd been painting for 30 years at that point, selling for a long time, but I wanted to try something different. I was at one of those roadblock points. So I picked up a painting knife really for the first time. I'd used it a little bit, but not really seriously. And I painted all of those daily paintings with a painting knife and fell in love with it. But the first ones were God awful. They were what I call my gloopy paintings. Did I share them? You betcha. Because I'd made that commitment and I posted those suckers every day and gradually they got better. And my email list cheered me on to the point that if I got close to missing the normal time that I sent that email out at four o'clock in the afternoon, I would get a message from some of my friends who are on the list. Where's the painting? Why haven't you posted yet? So you can build that eager audience before the paintings are totally ready and they will enjoy watching the paintings develop over time. You don't have to have the perfect series yet. You do not have to have the perfect style. So all of that will happen automatically when you paint. You don't have to think about it, just paint. Next thing up here, platform. So when we're talking about platform, and I know some of you were on the um, workshop back in September, October. So I bet you a bunch of y'all were on here um, in September, October when I did the workshop then. And that was all about the platform. So when I'm talking about your online platform, remember galleries and outdoor events were the traditional platform. That was your venue. Think about it as your venue. And it's kind of static. So the platform has three components. And the first is your website. Got to have a website. No, you can't live just on Facebook and Instagram. And here's why. Your website, you own. You absolutely own it. Nobody can take it away from you. As long as you keep paying the hosting bill, nobody's going to take it away from you. You won't wake up one morning and that, company won't have dropped your whole site like Etsy has done to people. Your platform won't disappear like when MySpace disappeared. So this is super important. It's the first part of your own real estate. Gotta have it. And it doesn't have to be super complicated. It can be relatively simple. And there are systems out there that make it really easy. And I think some of y'all, because I talked about it a little bit on Monday, and I want to shout out to all of the people, there were at least three that I saw in the Facebook group, who went and started their FASO website after our session on Monday. High five, way to go, because it's that easy. Now, it can take some time to tweak it, but really establishing it and setting it up using that system is so much easier than doing it on your own. I used to design websites. That was one of my side gigs. Remember, I always had that three-legged stool. So I go back to the coding days. I coded, created, designed the college's first website. Spent one whole summer doing it from May until August is how long it took two of us, the tech developer and me, to code, shoot all the photos, and get that website up. Almost four months. Doesn't have to take that long. You don't have to be a techie. There are systems out there that make it super easy. One is Squarespace. Y'all familiar with Squarespace? Lots of people have heard of Squarespace. It's good, it's got some great templates. Problem with Squarespace is it's not designed just for artists. It's not really designed for artists. It works, but there's some better solutions out there that are just for artists. You own the site, it won't go away. They just provide the platform for you to put it on there. FASO, and as Kathy says, FASO has great support. That's my big 
plus for FAFSA. And I am not an affiliate for FAFSA yet. I will be down the road. They don't even have an affiliate program. So I'm not getting anything back for suggesting that you go to them. But I'm going to share the screen here again, and we're going to cruise over to FAFSA really fast here. And we're going to be doing some more of this next week, too, with some individual people. We are going to go and look at how easy it is to set up a really good looking website. So FAFSA, their pricing is really reasonable. It's not super expensive. The goal plan is what I recommend. It's $25 a month. That is comparable to getting hosting on one of the cheaper, non-art specific websites, which can cost you about $10 a month, and then paying for an email service, which FASO includes, another $10, $15 a month, and a shopping cart, which FASO all in also includes, all in one spot, and a support system that can help you when you have a problem. They've got a ticketing system and you can get to somebody on the phone if you have a big issue. They've also got fantastic tutorials that are right there in their support website too that will walk you through the stages and steps to set your site up. So all you have to do is start a free trial. Click the start a free trial, enter your name, your last name, your email address, and a password for FASO. So it's like this. That's how long it took me. Pretty fast, huh? Yeah, and the intro version's good, Casey. The reason I like the gold plan is because it gives you the shopping cart. You can always upgrade later, but it gives you all the bells and whistles. You get more email addresses and stuff. Then all you do is pick out your template. And they have lots of pretty templates. It's going to be slow and going there. There we go. So lots of good looking templates, all designed to showcase your artwork and it you don't have to worry about picking the right template or the wrong template because you can switch it out you can start with one and then switch to another so just pick one to get started we'll preview tyler yeah you may be grandfathered in casey i can't remember how they split it out We'll have to look at that as I back out of it. So here's what it would look like. And at the bottom, because the email system comes with it, is a sign up for your email newsletter. Now, I don't like calling them newsletters, but sign up for the regular email, the bulk email that you send out, which is part of the platform. So you can get everything but your social media hub right here on FASO. So that is all you have to do, and then click your create site with that and get started. It really is that simple. There's a back behind dashboard where you set up the pages and you set up your email and you set up your email subscriber list. But you can do an awful lot just with FASA, FASA.com. Um, Art Storefronts is another one. It's newer. There are a couple of others as well that are all within art. But I really recommend that if you're not a techie, that you go to one of those, unless you really love designing websites. It's easier than a WordPress website. Mine is WordPress, but like I said, I used to be a web designer. So go from, go to FASA. Stephanie, what is his question? What about having a domain name? You definitely need that. And it needs to be yourname.com because when you're creating an online business platform for your art, you are creating what we call a personal brand. You're selling the idea of yourself as much as you're selling your artwork. So don't call it My Little Pretty Ponies call it yourname.com 
and you might have to put your middle name in there. You might have to put the word art on the end, but it needs to be your name, art, whatever, dot com. Some variation of that. And FASO helps you to hook that up. So you can do all of that through FASO. Gwen, there are ways to do around that. Gwen says, and I'm gonna pop into the questions when there's one that's right on there. Um, Gwen says, I named mine after my gallery's name, not my own. How do I change this? You don't necessarily have to change it. And when you've had one that long, Gwen, because you've had yours for a while, what I would do is get your name.com and have it do what they call point to your website. So in essence, then you've got two domain names that all go to the same place. So there, there are ways around that. You, don't, you haven't messed up. You can fix that. It's super, super easy to do that. But it's super important to have your name in there so that people associate your name with the website and the art. It's part of that branding process. So the website's the first part of the platform, really crucial part of the platform. It needs to have your art on it, and it needs to have a way for people to sign up for your email list, and it needs to have a place for them to contact you. It does not need to have 14 galleries of 14 series of paintings. You can start with four paintings. You can start with 10 paintings. Start with what you have. Don't wait to get started on it. Get it up there. It doesn't have to have 10 pages. You can get by with just two. You could have that front page that has your four paintings on it, and you can have the contact page and have the subscribe form down at the bottom of both of those. So it doesn't need to be perfect. Don't spend weeks and months. You don't need to spend four months on it like we did on the college's website back in the day. You can spend one afternoon on just getting those bare basics up because you can embroider on it, you can elaborate on it later, but get it up. The second part of the platform, and I see some people typing this in all the way, Sandra's talking about MailChimp already, is the email list. So yes, you need an email service provider to host your email list. So the email list is the second part of the platform. It's how you're going to communicate and contact your perfect people. And there are a whole lot of different service providers out there for an email list. This is not the same as your regular email address. And make sure you are not sending out bulk emails from your regular emailing address. And you can't just add your address book to a bulk email and send it out. That's actually illegal. People have to opt in. People have to give you permission to send them a bulk email, a marketing email. And if you don't have that, you can actually get fined. So people have to sign up. You can't just put people on your email list. Make sure you don't ever do that. It's a recipe for disaster. And most countries I know of have some pretty strict laws that are like the GDPR in Europe and the can spam laws here. So make sure you're following the law there. So that's why you've got to have an email service provider. FASO has that. It's all built in. It's part of their plan. Another one that I recommend for people who are just starting out because they have a free plan is the one that I see a bunch of people mentioning is MailChimp. It's what I started with. MailChimp is free up until a fairly high level of subscribers, and it's gotten a whole lot more sophisticated than it used to be. So MailChimp is a fantastic place to start with your email list. One of the reasons you need that list over, say, just relying on social media is that, again, social media can disappear. Platforms come and go. We're all familiar with all of the struggles that Facebook has had in the last four or five years. Who knows what the future holds for Facebook? They're not the only social media platform out there. They're just the biggest. 
those can come and go. Your email list, you like the website, own, it's yours. Nobody can take it away from you. So you need to have that as your main communication system. And the difference between it and social media, I was talking about this in class just the other day. Email is different, way different than social media. When you post on Instagram or Facebook, you're talking to everybody who walks by. It's like having a conversation on the street corner. You're talking publicly to everybody. When you're on your email list and you're sending it out to your subscribers, you're talking to one person at a time. Your email comes from you and it goes to a specific address. And when you write like you're talking to one person, that's how you build relationships. It's a little harder to do in the beginning on social media, but you can definitely do it with email. And I know people who have a thriving online business with just email and a website. I don't think that's the easiest way. That's the long, circuitous way to build an online platform. You got to have that email list. So an email list is where you communicate with your perfect people on a weekly basis. Did everybody hear that? Every single week. And we all fall off the wagon periodically. And then you have to warm the email list back up again and go, oopsie, I've been bad. You don't want to email just once a month. That's not enough. It worked five years ago, sort of. It worked 10 years ago, gangbusters, because people didn't get as many emails in their inbox. How many emails did y'all have in your inbox this morning? I had a good 50 to 100. Do you think I read all of them? Yeah, Leslie says tons. And Cheryl says, eek, I've not kept up with quarterly emails. Yeah, you got to do more than that. Here's why the newsletter format, because this is what people, and there are still people teaching this. It drives me batty when I see it because it's wrong. It does not work. And I'll tell you why it doesn't work. Um, the old newsletter format was you would design an email that was long. And that was a lot like the physical newsletters you get in your email, in your, your snail mail mailbox that would have lots of pretty colorful pictures, a colorful background, sometimes two or three columns and lots of articles, articles about your artwork, about shows you were in, um, workshops you taught, all kinds of stuff. And people would put off writing it until the 12th of never because it took so long to prepare. You don't have to do that anymore. In fact, you should not do that anymore. And here's why. It won't get into the inbox of the people who are on your email list. It won't be delivered. It's not that they won't open it, they won't even get it. And the reason they won't get it is that Gmail, Yahoo Mail, Hotmail, all of those mail systems block what they call spam or promotional emails. And the old newsletter format triggers all of those spam alerts and they don't even pass the email to your inbox. So if you write in the old newsletter format with all the pretty fancy, um, fonts and colors and multiple pictures and 20 different links to lots of different things, it's not going to get there because those email systems want just one link per email, one to two images per email in order to get through. When you have more than that, when it's too fancy and too big, it won't pass through the filters. So the old newsletter format needs to go bye-bye. Even though they call it newsletter, email newsletter on FASA, it's, that's the tool. It's still got the label on there, but think of it as email list. Don't think of it as a newsletter. The other problem with the newsletter is that people would just postpone forever writing it because it was just so hard to do. If you're writing a more conversational email once a week, to your list, 
They're way more likely to do it. And it's also a whole lot more fun to read because people don't want to open things that go on forever because guess how we I'm looking to see if I have my phone here. I do. So when we get an email, 80% of my subscribers open their email on this tool right here. And if they have to do this over and over and over to get through your whole email, they're not going to do it. They'll scroll for just a certain way and then they're not going to keep on scrolling too much further. Long emails don't work anymore either. So you need to write short emails and they need to be conversational and friendly and all about building relationship with that one person who's getting it on the other end. So banish the newsletter, don't do those anymore, and write regular emails to your list once a week. Get that email list going. The old saying about trees, when this is the best time to plant a tree, is the same as the best time to start an email list. It's now. The best time to start was 10 years ago. Second best time is now. So if you haven't started one yet, start it now and invite your family and friends to begin with. That was who was on mine to begin with. I started, I think it was either 34 or 37 people on my email list and three of them were me because I used some of my multiple emails that I've got. So you need to realize that the time to start it is now and it will grow. That's that audience part that we're gonna talk about on Friday. But the time to get it started is now. So the kind of information you send to your list is the story of your art. Talk about what you're doing in the studio. Send them an image of a painting. Tell them about the painting. There are all kind of different things that you can tell. Think about the kind of questions that you get from family and friends about your artwork. That's what you need to write in those emails. So that's the second part of the platform. There's one last part of the platform, and that is your social media hub. And this is why I call it the hub. So it's your social media hub because the social media hub is what you use to drive traffic to your website to get people to join your email list. It's not the end destination. It's the beginning of the system for building your audience. Crucial to have one. So we get more than a million views a month on Pinterest for the Studio Pinterest account. That drives a tremendous amount of traffic. In fact, probably some of y'all who are on today found me through Pinterest. It's our main social driver of traffic. But the only way you get traffic to your website is by putting out a big billboard on a highway where the traffic already exists. So think about the internet social media platforms as being the interstates. And you have your website off of one of those exits and you want people to take that exit. Well, the only way they're going to know that there's anything at that exit is if you put a billboard out there, you post on social media so that they have some reason to go to that exit, to go to your website. So social media is your billboard out for the rest of the world. And if you don't have a social media account, it's really hard to get traffic. It's really hard to get eyeballs on your artwork. And remember that conversion rate again, you got to have one 50 people before you'll get one sale. And that's not just 50 people on the internet looking at you. It's got to be 50 people walking onto your website, 50 people on your email list in order to get that sale. It's 2% of 2% of 2% of 2%. So when I look at where I get traffic coming in, there's that initial traffic hit. And there can be thousands of eyeballs that have gotten onto a post on social media, the reach. Two to 3% of that will then go to the link that I post in there and click on it. Then two to 3% of that 
will sign up for my email list and two to three percent of that will buy a painting. See how that works? So you've got to start with that reach and the initial eyeballs and then bring people down that customer journey. If you don't do that, you're not going to have a sale. Then you're going to tell yourself the story like my follower who broke my heart on Instagram who said she had a website but no sales and maybe she should stop. This just wasn't for her. It wasn't her website. It wasn't her artwork. It was a traffic problem. She had nobody coming to her website. So you've got to bring people in there. It's not enough to build it and then think they'll come. They won't. You got to give them a map and you got to put a billboard out on the highway. Yeah, just like the old Burma shave signs on the highway. Exactly, France. Um, Francesca, exactly. Just like those Burma shave signs. You've got to have a billboard. You've got to give people a way, a path back to your stuff. If you don't, they're not going to find you. Um, it's it's like the, um, going back to the old system, I had a friend who was in grad school at the same time I was, and he firmly believed, because he believed the story that somehow he got somewhere, that just having an MFA meant he would get into a New York art gallery. And I remember him coming up close to graduation, telling everybody, well, I graduate on Saturday, and I'm going to New York on Monday to get a gallery. And bless his heart, he got on the plane, flew to New York, stayed a week because that's how long he'd given himself to get the gallery. And guess what happened? Nothing, <laughs> because that's not how it works. Just having an MFA is not enough to get into a gallery. Just having paintings is not enough to get into a gallery. Just having a website is not enough to get the buyers and the eyeballs. You gotta have the traffic. And social media is the big driver of traffic. Um, so I see a lot of questions coming in. I want to mention those last two. I'm watching the time too. I want to mention those last two components of the five-step system because we're going to be talking about those on the coming two days. And so I want to talk about this in a second before we go to questions because I see 4 million comments on there that I want to get back to. So remember, on Friday, we're going to be talking about audience and how to get that traffic. Traffic is what gets people over here from the platform to buying. Traffic, it's what converts your audience and connects your audience and your artwork. So we're going to be talking about audience and traffic on Friday and sales mechanism on Monday. Be sure to put those on your calendar. If you can't make it live, remember that the recordings will be available on the directory page. And remember, there's a Cersei coming your way too, so you can keep up with all of these five things. So you've got to have the mindset for success. You've got to have the thriving artist mindset. You've got to create compelling paintings from your heart. Doesn't work to paint whatever you think the current selling, top selling style is. People see through that in a heartbeat. Then you've got to have a platform with a website, email list, social media hub to build an engaged audience to bring them to the sales mechanism. Got it? So we're going to talk about those two things on the coming sessions, but I want to, to make sure I get through some of these questions because I think I have just put a fire hose in front of y'all's mouths and sprayed it at you really hard. So sorry if it seems like an awful lot. So let me get back through here and um, go in through to find the questions and not just the haze from everybody. It's good to have people from all over. I see people from Paris and people from New Mexico, Alaska, and everywhere else. Awesome. So, yeah. Caroline says she's in the midst of setting up a website. Perfect. Remember that you just want it simple. Get it started. Get very, very basic thing going with that. And yes, you can actually make money with your art. Um, 
Let me get to the questions because those were the big takeaways from last time. And and everybody talking about Circe's. Susan says, I really believe what you say about sharing. Somebody needs that. That is really, really true. It's enormously true. And it's something I feel um, really incredibly strongly about. We have a responsibility as artists. Everybody has a responsibility to give back. It's part of what makes us human beings. It's, it's actually part of our DNA. But you have to live into that or you'll always feel like something is missing there. So Carolyn says, that's what amazed me in your last video session. You said that people will buy and pay top dollars for art through the internet without seeing it in person. They sure will. So going back to like Ashley Longshore, whose paintings are, I'm thinking most of them run in the between like 15 and $35,000 a painting. James Jean's are even more expensive. He's incredibly expensive because he's painting huge paintings and he's in high demand. Yeah. Ashley sells her paintings by posting on Instagram. I love the way she does it. Like I said, we're going to talk about it more on in another session, but I'm going to see if I can pull up one where she is describing that it's, here it is. So what she usually post is, let's see if I can get to that one. And she doesn't do it every time. It's like every 10th post is about buying a painting. And what she'll say is that it's available in her shop. If you're interested, email sparkles at ashleylongshore.com. That's it. That's her sales message. And it's not sleazy. It's not buy my stuff, buy my stuff. It's not getting in your face about buying it. It's just, if you're interested, email sparkles at ashleylongshore.com. So it doesn't have to be sleazy or nasty. Not at all. People absolutely will pay big price. And James Jean, J-E-A-N. And Anne says, I got a degree in chemistry. Yes, my dad was a chemist and my uncle was a chemist. My cousins are chemists. Everybody in my family is either in science or art, Anne. So I understand the chemistry part of that. And the truth of it is that being a scientist and a lot of artists give up their art and go into science. Being a scientist is the same thing. I'm early on absorbed that what my dad and my uncle did in their labs was really similar to what I wanted to do in the studio. They experimented, they explored, and they created. So scientists are makers too. And lots of people get that negative feedback from their family. It's really frustrating. Thank you, Lee, for putting Ashley Longshore's uh, web address in there. Awesome. Susan says, that ping happened last month for me via PayPal. That's fantastic. I love that. Get it. That sound is just magical when you hear it go ping, ping, ping. And PayPal is the easiest shopping cart to get started with. But it has a notif it's the only notification I want to turn on. Because when somebody buys your painting, it's magical. It tells you that people believe in you, believe in what you're doing, and that somebody loves what you're doing. They're willing to pay money for it. So that's awesome. Amazing. Elaine says she was lucky her mom supported her art degree, but I got sidelined as an illustrator for 30 years to make dollars instead of making paintings. That happens to a lot of people. Like I said, I designed websites for a long time and I worked as an illustrator too, in addition to teaching until I realized that I actually could make money selling my paintings. So um, Kathy says, I've been getting traffic through FASO's daily art show. What do you know about that? Is that a separate charge? No, it's free. Um, I'm pretty sure it's free because I've had other students who've gotten traffic from that. FASO does a really nice job of traffic. Another site that does that is Daily Paintworks. 
they promote the artists to have a site on their site. And so your other people get, other people's eyeballs get on your work who are not in your sphere of influence. And I think that's one of the benefits to being on one of those art platforms is they do bring in traffic all on their own. FASO features the artists who are on there on their um, daily art show. Daily Paintworks features a range of artists on their Facebook page. And you'll get an email message that says, congratulations, you've been featured today on the Facebook page. So yeah, it, those are perfectly legitimate things to do and it's fantastic when that happens. And they do it um, for all of the artists who are on there. They don't do it every day, all the time, but they rotate through and feature people on a regular basis. So you'll get traffic just from being there. Susan says, when you told us about niche, I thought I paint the soft side of life. And my first buyer said, that's what she feels like when she sees my art. That is a real crucial part right there. Feeling is really important. People buy because of how your art makes them feel and they justify it with logic. I need that for over my sofa, but it makes me feel like fill in the blank. So that's the language you want to write down and hold on to. And Sue, you can absolutely ask questions and anything that you want, just type it into the chat roll and I'll come back to it. Um, yes, Samara says many artists are not taken seriously and it can be really frustrating. You just have to ignore it. We have a saying here in the South that's so useful. Oops, losing my earbud. It is so useful for those situations. You just look at them and you say, bless your heart and move on, leave them behind. What it actually means, it sounds really sweet. It doesn't, it's Southern for F you, but they don't know that, bless their hearts. And you can also say, um, thank you for your feedback because people love to tell artists how they could do it better, whether it's their paintings or their sales or whatever. Thank you for your feedback and just move on. Nod, shake your head and move on. You're never going to convince those people and there's no point. What will convince them is your success. Don't let it hold you back. Just keep on moving. Um, Chris says the one job I got recently, it's, or the one that he got recently is it's not like you have a real job. Oh, I've gotten that. I still get that. Even though I make my living from doing this and I have two full-time employees, I get the, it's not a real job or isn't it wonderful that you get to play all day? Again, you just say, thank you for your feedback and bless your heart. Um, partially at times it's they're jealous. You're getting to do something you love. And the other part is they just have no clue what goes into making art and that's okay. It's our job to educate people too. Yes, and as Francesca says, Grandma Moses was in her 80s, I think, when she was first picked up and was selling and alive well into her 90s. My friend painted and was alive well into her 90s as well. She had a long, very profitable career. Um, yeah, Leslie says, the I am too old is a sad statement and what a way not to make any great painting opportunities. Yeah, don't anybody let them hold that hold you back. Gwen says, I became a minister at 70, and Gwen had to hop off, but this is really important to hear. And I know Gwen. Gwen said, I became a minister at 70, so painting at my age is duck soup. Keep that in mind. It's never too late to follow your dreams. And Gwen has figured out how to follow two dreams at one time. She is a minister with an active, active service and ministry. And she is a painter, an artist, who's really active in her community and is selling her paintings. So it's possible to do those things you love to do. Awesome. Patricia says, I think there's also an attitude that because we enjoy doing our work, it's not as important. I totally agree, totally agree. Um, and the friend of mine was Laura Spong and she, she painted all her life, but she didn't start doing it full time until she was 65. 
Don't look at how much time you've wasted. Just look at how much time you have and make a start. Make a start. So you've got plenty of time. You just need to do it. Don't let things hold you back. Um, Mary says she just started. She recently retired. Awesome. Getting back to where I have questions again and not just responses to what I've asked. Um, oh, yeah, Susie is in a situation that a lot of people have been in. She says, I care for a three-year-old. My studio's on the porch, so weather affects when I can get out there. What size paintings sell better? All size paintings sell. So I know another, there was another question I saw further down about why so many of the paintings on my website are small. I do a lot of daily painting and I do a lot of plein air painting. Small paintings provide an easy entrance into your world for collectors. And so it's very easy to use those to grow new collectors. So one of the reasons I do small paintings is because I can do a small painting in a short period of time. And it's easiest when I'm out painting plein air to work fairly small. I can capture the experience before the light changes too fast. But larger paintings sell as well. I like doing really small pieces. And I like doing really big pieces. This is back here is an in-between size. It's about 30 by 40. Big is five by six feet. The biggest painting I've done was a mural in the Vista Center at the Congaree National Park that one wall was probably 20 feet, then 12 feet, and then another 20 feet. So all of them work. Pick the size that works for you. And my guess is with a three-year-old and a small space to work in, small is going to work really well for you right now. You can do big later. But do what you can right now and do what you can well and comfortably. It's absolutely possible to sell those. And Elaine, you can absolutely find your niche. You just have to fo you focus on one thing at a time. You can have lots of different interests. But you get one plate spinning first and get that going, then start the next, then start the next. If you try to get them all going at one time, one will fall and this one will break and then you won't have any hands to grab the one over here. So you do need to focus on one thing at a time. Doesn't mean you give up the other things at all. So same thing for Claire and See, so Denise, um, focus on what you love. She's, Denise says, I'm not sure I'm good enough. Also unsure what style I should focus on. Style develops all on its own. You don't need to decide that. You just need to paint what you love, and the style will come out of that when you show up at the easel on a regular basis. And you are good enough for the people who will love your work right now. And you'll get better when you show up on a regular basis. So we're going to be working on those niches for everybody who's got questions about that. Yeah, pricing is definitely part of selling. We're getting to that later. Pieces sell both framed and unframed. It depends on the situation. I sell most of my work online unframed because it's lighter to ship. And most people have an idea of what kind of frame they want to put on it when you're shipping worldwide. So. Online, I do unframed. In the gallery, framed. So it just depends on the situation. Um, Karen says, the thing is to find an unusual niche, which is not already oversaturated like the horses are. Yes and no. The niche comes from the style that develops all on its own. So you don't invent the niche. You find the niche that fits your work. And even equestrian art is not oversaturated. There is an audience out there for your work, no matter what style it is that you love to paint in. You just need to make compelling paintings. When you look at the sea of artwork out there, most of it's pretty mediocre. 
and most of it doesn't stand out. So what I mean by compelling paintings is it's got to have a strong composition. It's got to have a definite focal point and it needs to use value and color well. When it's compelling, it doesn't matter which style you're working in, people will be drawn to it. It's like when you scroll through those equestrian watercolors in the contemporary modern style, which I pulled up in Saatchi, there were so many interesting pieces and they're all different. Because here's the thing, no two people are gonna make the same painting. They're gonna be different. And they're gonna be people who are attracted to yours, but not attracted to that art star over on the left. So don't let that stop you. By all means, do not let that stop you. Um, yeah, Sandra, I'm gonna get that link to y'all. And Susan says, on Saatchi, you referred to print as originals only, but aren't prints reproductions? No, there are two kinds of prints. There are original prints, which are etchings, intaglios, lithographs, silk screens, and monotypes. And those kind of prints are still made by hand. They're made by the artist going into the studio and drawing on the plate, and then running that plate through a press by hand and making an addition of original prints. They're not reproductions, they are originals that are created by running that plate through the press. It's really different from reproductions. Reproductions are copies of originals, usually now done by making photographic copies and then making inkjet, i.e. gicle prints. Those are not original prints at all. You can, because they're digital, you can print five million of them. An original print comes in a limited edition. Um, when you are making, for example, an etching, an edition of etchings, the plate wears out after it, it begins to get soft and, and break down, certainly after 25. You really can't make a bigger edition than about 25 prints. So those are worth more than the digital reproduction where you can make 5 million. So that's the difference between an original print and a reproduction. One is its own original individual artwork, and the other is a copy of the individual artwork. Um, awesome, Leslie. I love that you're gonna show that to the kids that you're teaching. They, I think that's really important. Kudos for doing that. Children need to know that there's an outlet for whatever it is that they're interested in. They don't have to go paint what they think is the big market. Awesome, and no problem if caps go on. I don't care about that. Yeah, Francesca says, just like teachers I've had that told us that the only way to be successful was to use their brushes, their paint, etc. I tell my students to run if they encountered, encountered a teacher that tells them that. I agree. That's why I have a really short list of other teachers that I recommend. Um, a, a good teacher is not trying to make a carbon copy of themselves. What they're trying to do is empower their student to set their own creativity free, to discover what their creative urge is, not to make them a carbon copy. Awesome. Yeah, it happens with miles of canvas, as Gwen says. Um, Diane says, my niche is marine art in realism and contemporary. Get Instagram attention, but no sales yet. That's that sales mechanism problem and probably a problem getting them over to your website and onto your email list. So getting attention on social media is not enough. You've got to move people from social media to making that commitment to being on your email list and on your website. Um, sure, I'm getting down to questions and not just comments. If I skip your question before we end, make sure that you tag me in the group and I'll come back to check on it. Yes, Diane says, when you post, you develop a following. That is so true. Lisa says, how do you prevent yourself from getting too discouraged when paintings aren't working? Start another one. Um, my own trick for that is I work on more than one painting at a time. 
So obviously when I'm going out to paint plein air, I've got one painting on the easel at a time, but in the studio, I have more than one at a time. I've worked on the one that's behind me for a while and you can't see over in the corner, but there's a stack of paintings back there. So in my main studio in Columbia, I've got three paintings at a time hung on the wall to work because big paintings don't work real well on easels. So I get started on three at a time. And when I'm frustrated with one, I go to the next one. The other thing to do is to walk out and come back because they look totally different when you do that. Paula says, how do I get people to go to my website? That is the topic for Friday. How do you get people to go to your website? How do you get your audience from social media to your website? And we're going to be covering that then. I see a bunch of people who've asked that. We're going to be going over that on Friday. Um, yeah, Claire says, all the work that you do to set up a good website, get good image, prepare descriptions, set pricing, you still own no matter what. That is absolutely true. Preach. Um, yeah, Sharon says she rejoined FASO and likes the changes she's seen. Yeah, me too. FASO used to be kind of staid and, and stuffy, and then they changed. They updated tremendously. So they were more like Squarespace, but for artists. I think that makes a big difference. Uh, Sally, you can't go wrong with any of the FASO layout. She says, do you know what the most efficient website FASO layout? Any of them that are on that front page, just pick one. You can change it later. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> mm. Having earbuds in always makes me sneeze. Um, so don't worry about which one. Just pick the one that you initially think looks the best. And if you don't like it and it doesn't work for you, you can switch it. And it won't do anything. Clover, per WordPress is fantastic if you're comfortable using it. That's what I use. And I use the Divi theme, so the Divi framework. So it's absolutely possible to do that. Um, C. Strickle says, I learned coding online and made the first version of my website. Now I use Dreamweaver. Yeah, I used to use that too. Um, the problem with Dreamweaver is in any of those old coding platforms is that it's hard coded and it's not flexible. You can get a lot more flexibility with WordPress and FASO and Squarespace are basically managed WordPress sites. So I would use WordPress, Squarespace, FASO, one of those. Um, Kathy says, I build websites, but is it better to use a shared site? No, uh, it's okay to begin with to use something like GoDaddy or Bluehost or one of those. Um, but ultimately shared hosting cannot handle traffic. So side rabbit hole. I launched a collection of paintings a couple of years ago. So and launching was my sales mechanism. So I had promoted this collection of paintings for about a month on my social media sites and via my email. And I had a lot of people getting really excited about them. I was going to release the collection of paintings at I can't remember what time, maybe it was six o'clock in the evening on a certain date. And my email list would have first access before it went public. Well, because I still had my site on GoDaddy at the time, when my email list, and I have a lot of people on my email list. There were um, thousands of people who are on my email list. My email list has about 25,000 people on it. Um, not all of those were buying paintings, but about half of them. And when I sent that email out that said they're live now, people hopped on to grab their favorite painting and they crashed the server. They crashed my website. So once you get a big enough email list, you need to move off of shared hosting because you'll crash your server. And that is a bad customer experience. It's a good problem to have, but it's a bad customer experience. And you don't want to do that. So you don't tend to have that problem with FASO or Squarespace because they've got redundant servers behind them to keep that problem from having, happening. Um, yes, Sue says, I'm not a techie. I need to paint, so FASO is fabulous. Awesome. Um, Francesca, no. Um, FASO is a service. 
It is a hosting platform, a place where you park your website. You own your website. Just like if you host it on GoDaddy, GoDaddy is the platform, it's the parking garage where you're parking your car, which is your website. You still own your website. Bluehost is another one. You still own your website. You can move it to another place. It's portable. So FASO doesn't own your website, you do. Art Storefronts is good. Yeah, they've got good support too. So Casey says almost every serious two-dimensional artist I know uses FASO. Yeah, exactly. Um, I know until they get way too much traffic, it's just easier. If I were not a web designer, I would use FASO because it's that easy and I still get tempted periodically because it um, is so easy to set up and it's behind a firewall. It's secure. You don't have to worry about being hacked. Fill in the blank with all the worries you don't have to have. Um, but it is really, really a good service. Chris, you can start with the intro version and then move up to the goal version with your re when you're ready. Absolutely. And as Mary Jane says with FASA, you get your own domain. Yeah. I think you get a lot with that intro version. So don't worry about that. Um, Leslie says she was with Wix and you had to do everything separately and got charged for it. FASO is so much better. That's one of my problems with Wix. I agree. Teresa says, what word do you like better than newsletter? I like email list. She says, I'm in the middle of getting a FASO site set up. What I've tell my students to do is on the website itself. Now you can't change the name of it in the back end on the dashboard, but when you're creating the link on your website, instead of saying, um, join my newsletter, say, join my email list. Because even the word newsletter can put some people off. So that's what I would use is email list. Um, Clover, if you have a WordPress one and it's working for you, you're fine. I would stay where you are for right now. Christine says, should you have a separate email address for your art business? Yes, definitely. And it needs to have your domain name in there, not Gmail. Definitely not Gmail. Um, yeah, uh, what's not this best? Yeah, FASO Tech can help with almost any issue. And as Casey says, FASO also helps with SEO, which is search engine optimization. In other words, it helps you be found. Um, they're really good about optimizing things there. Kate says, can I move to FASO and take my domain name with me? Yes, you can. You can move to another platform and your domain can be pointed to that platform. So you absolutely can move there. Thank you, KC. That's awesome that you're helping Chris out there. Yeah, FASO support is fantastic. And you can move content from WordPress to FASO. But Clover, since you're on WordPress right now, I don't know that I would move yet. Yes, a lot of people get discounts, uh, have discount codes for FASO. Saunders says, I use MailChimp for my email list. Can they transfer that to FASO? Yes, you can use MailChimp on FASO. FASO has guidelines and directions on how to embed a MailChimp form on your page. And you just set that as your email provider in your dashboard. So you can absolutely use MailChimp. Continue using MailChimp. And as Casey says, don't forget the contest. Yeah, FASO does a lot of stuff like that. Chris says, what about if my name is horrible? Still use it? Yep, yeah, it's unique. Hand raised right here. Now, I love my name, but how often do you hear somebody say Gilkerson? And how many people do you think mispronounce it? Every third person. I've gotten Gillespie, Grigsby, Glickerson. All, hardly ever does anybody get the right one. But having my own domain name and having had it since the early 90s, has been really good for people hunting for me. So yeah, use your name. Absolutely, it's yours and it'll make it so easy for people to find you. Um, Caroline says, I've 
agonized about using my full name, my nickname that everybody calls me. What if I know it won't be pronounced the way I pronounce it? Don't overthink it. Just use the name you go by professionally. That's the name it's going to become your brand. Cheryl says, if I have a Weebly website and MailChimp email list, is it worth it to switch to FASA? Weebly and Wix are fine to get started with. The problem with either one of those is that exporting your website, getting it off of there is really difficult. And they have a tendency to nickel and dime you for every single service. So if you're on Weebly or Wix, I would take a look at FASA and see what they offer in terms of comparing it to those other two platforms, because I do think it's better for the same amount of money. But you have to do that comparison for yourself and see whether it's worth it to you to move. Stephanie says, a question from Mariana. Should I have direct sales of the paintings? Yes, definitely. She says, I have that for prints, but I like to know my paintings customers. It's so hard to let them go. Um, I think when you're painting enough, it's not as hard to let them go. It's hard at the very beginning, but you do get to the point where it's okay to let them out the door. And if you're building a relationship with your email list, you do know the, the email list. You know your paintings buyers at that point. So you can build that relationship in. I definitely think it's worth it to have direct sales. Susie says, did you say I need MailChimp or similar with FASO? Um, with FASO, it comes with an email um, service provider. FASO is its own email service provider. So that's part of their system. You can bring MailChimp in if you already have it or if you prefer it, but you can get started with just what FASO offers. And yes, Cheryl, email every week. Here's why. There, we get hundreds of emails in their inbox every day. If you email once a week or once a quarter, people have forgotten who you are. They get that email and they go, who's this from? I don't know them. Click unsubscribe, report spam. And then that hurts your deliverability and you lose your email list. It's called a cold list, and you can't market to a cold list. So you need to have a conversation often. Think about those people, the family members you only see once a year. You don't really have a relationship with them. You want to have a relationship with your potential clients and customers. And that has to happen from having a conversation. So yeah, once a week, send an email. Yes, Caroline, I recommend a shopping cart. Um, I don't recommend contact me and then PayPal at all. Here's why. Every extra step that you put into that process that makes it hard for people to buy means they go off and buy from somebody else. So no, I would not do that. I would have a shopping cart. Because, and link it to PayPal, because PayPal has a lot of protection for both buyer and seller. PayPal even has a little simple shopping cart. But yeah, you need a shopping cart, because people need to have an easy way to purchase. So yes, got to get past those quarterly emails. And it doesn't have to be overwhelming, Mary Jane. You take it one step at a time, not everything all at once. Not everything all at once. So, um, yeah, Jane, you'll get the recording. Leslie says, in these days, hardly anyone will stop and read all of the stuff. That's right. Your email needs to be short enough that it pretty much fits on the screen and people don't have to scroll more than one push or they're not going to read it. So long form emails really don't work very well anymore. Occasionally they do. I tested it out about two years ago. And so I tried some really long form emails because somebody told me they were doing better. And I dropped it like a hot potato because I had people who actually complained. And there were people I knew, they said, why are you writing such long emails? 
what happened to the short emails with just the image and the I want the story. I don't want to have to scroll through all of this stuff. People are busy and they've got so many distractions. If you have a long thing that they, you're going to lose them along the way and they will not get to the bottom of the email. Um, Patricia Young from Facebook. How long should a newsletter be? I just covered that really short. What you can see on a, a phone screen and not about you, not about your upcoming shows, not about um, your awards. Your emails need to be about the stuff your customers want to hear about. They want to hear about your paintings. They want to hear about the story about your paintings. They want to hear about how the paintings are going to make them feel. Not about what show you were in last week or what event you're going to go to next month. So make it about them. Look at the emails you get in your inbox that you bother to read. Look at an email from, say, an online clothing catalog that you really love. What is it you love about them? They talk about what their product is going to do for you. They're not telling you about where they went for vacation or what supplier they went to look at for fabric, although sometimes they do occasionally when it's the story of the product. But it's about the customer, not about us. Once a month is better than no email at all? Um, not really. Once a month is almost the same as no email at all. So um, what I would suggest, Sigrid, is, and I think we've had this conversation before, is shorter emails that are more manageable. If you write really short emails that are just an image and a couple of lines about the painting, and do that once a week, that's a hundred times better than a longer email once a month or a really long email once a quarter. So once a month is the same as no email. Think about if you get an email from some business just once a month, you're still going, what is this and why is it, why is it in my inbox? So I would not do that. I would do one a week and keep it short, short, short and sweet. Go look at the emails from Dwayne Kaiser or Julian Marosmith. They're just the image and the text about the painting. And the text about the painting, I think on Dwayne Kaiser's, it's just the title. I think on both of theirs. So keep it really, really simple. Keep it less intimidating. Simple is better than complex. Um, yes, Ginger, FASO gives you an email address if you've got one, um, if you've got your domain name through them. So yes, and that you can set that up in there. It's in your dashboard. It's different from your email list. Yes, and one or two links only. I've gone down to just one. Rarely do I put two in there. It triggers the spam box. Um, Yes, Michelle, that's such an excellent question. Michelle says, should you have targeted email lists? Yes, 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 yes. So my business has two main threads, teaching and selling the paintings. I've got other sidelines as well, but those are the two main ones. So I have a segment that is just for teaching, and I have a segment that is just for the paintings. There are people on both, but I've got a segmented list. It means that people are not getting emails about things that they're not interested in. The more you can segment it down, the better. And that probably is too much information for most people. But yes, segmentation is an excellent, excellent thing. Um, how am I getting people's emails? I get them from... Pinterest, I get them from Facebook, I get them from Instagram, I get them from people going to my bios on those platforms, and I get them from people being driven from those platforms to my website. That's what we're going to talk about on Friday. How do I do it and find the time to paint? Ah, that is what a lot of people think that it takes a ton of time. Right now, I am painting every day for the Strata Easel Challenge. I, I'm painting plein air every day. And I still have time to be on here 
and I still have time to post on social media about the Strata Easel Challenge because I'm not creating fancy posts. I'm not trying to get into Photoshop and make the perfect picture. I'm shooting it with my iPhone right there in the less than stellar light. Sometimes in here at night when I bring it back in because it's gotten dark or too foggy to see. So letting go of the practically perfect post is one of the first ways. And to realize that short and sweet is better than long and windy. So keep it short and sweet and use blocks of time, really short blocks of time to get things done. It doesn't have to include hours and hours and hours a day. That's a great topic. We'll talk about that more on Friday. I'll spend some time on that. Am I going to talk about pricing today? Nope, not today. We're going to talk about that under sales mechanism because it, it's not really a part of the platform. We had too much to cover with the platform to get to pricing. Pricing in detail is, we're not going to go over, we'll get a broad picture of it when we talk about sales mechanism. Um, Pinterest and Instagram are not alike. They're really, really, really different. Pinterest, um, Pinterest is like YouTube. It's a search engine. Facebook and Instagram are social engagement conversation platforms. So yes, getting Google Analytics is fantastic down the road. You don't need to worry about that right now. Um, Susan says, as I build my body of work, what is a good way of storing and preparing for sale? Oh, um, gosh, that's almost too deep for us to go into today. But storing, I have a storeroom in my studio in Columbia because I have a, a separate dedicated space. And one whole room is storage. And you want shelves where things are not touching each other. And you want them up off the floor so they're not subject to moisture, damp, critters, and all that kind of stuff. But do not wrap them in plastic because plastic can damage and get stuck to paintings. Definitely don't do that. Um, put something in between them so they don't touch, like a good piece of foam core board. But um, yeah, that, that's a whole nother topic. Yes, you need to include your website link on your bio, but it should not be in every single post. Um, putting your website link in every single social media post is like saying, buy my stuff every time you meet somebody at a cocktail party. And the social media platforms don't like it because it drives traffic off of their website. So we're going to talk about that in more depth on Friday when we talk about audience, because that's part of the traffic and the audience but definitely do not do that. Um, oh, thank you, Susan. That's so sweet. Carolyn says, do you use a mailing app to know how much to charge for shipping? I use flat rate, U.S. Postal Service flat rate shipping, and I do it by the size. So I know what it's going to cost right up front. And if it's a larger piece that I'm shipping, then I use UPS for shipping here in the States, and DHL for overseas. When I'm shipping smaller pieces to Europe and the UK or to Canada, I still use the U.S. Postal Service's flat rate for small stuff because that gets it through customs really easily. Um, and they have an international rate. So there are all kinds of easy solutions for that. I don't have an app for it. Um, Instagram, the signs, the billboards, Ginger. Okay, that's a, an audience and traffic issue. So that's Friday. We're going to get to that on Friday. But that's how you get people to see your work. Um, and if you're not seeing very many people on Instagram, it's because you're not following them. So there, there's a system to move people from social media to your website to grow your audience and to engage with them, to get the traffic from social media to your website. Covering that on Friday is too much for us to get into today. Hashtags are crucial, Diane. I just did, I've been doing an Instagram experiment and posts that don't have hashtags get about two thirds of the reach to half the reach of posts with hashtags. 
And when people want to return something, I take it back. Having a 30 day return policy is one of the things that makes it safe for people to buy online. So you need to have a return policy and you can have it, it needs to be on your website and it can say 30 days with no damages something like that. But yeah, definitely take things back. Stores do that. It takes away the scary part. Um, awesome, Leslie. She says, man, this has taught me what I have not done. I'm starting over with a new attitude. Awesome. You can do this. You really can. And Sandra says, I suspect a lot of my emails have gone to spam. <coughs> That's that can happen and it's not the service provider per se. It's having too many links in there and too many um, images that will get it into spam. Um, yeah, and Cheryl says, FASA watercolor sales, people buy just the paintings rolled up or artists ship work matted and framed with glass. People do both. I wouldn't roll up paper if I could help it because it takes so long for that to, um, lay flat again. So for works on paper, I ship them flat and unframed. So definitely big, big pieces I ship rolled up. I mean, if you've got a six by eight foot painting, shipping that when it's on a stretcher is exorbitant. And yes, there's a template. No, I don't, Sandra, any of the templates on FASA are all good. There's no particular one that's better than another. Um, oh, Jan, I'm so glad that this helps. She says, I often felt like quitting my art pursuit. Stay stubborn because you can do it. And Susie says, how much is a Kmart price and how much is a Chanel price for pricing? Go to Saatchi Art like we just did earlier and look at the really inexpensive ones and then look at the expensive ones. And ironically, a lot of times it's easier to sell a bigger, more expensive piece than it is to sell a cheap, inexpensive piece. So people think that cheap is cheap and not well made. So there's a lot of perception to pricing. Um, you don't need very many at all to start, Mary. If you've got a website, you can put four to six pieces up there and be good to go with that. And Sue says, is it possible to have another online career presence, company or product? Yeah. I know people who, well, go back to James Jean. He sells um, diaries and notebooks. He sells products along with his paintings. And he's got a separate section on Shopify for that. Um, you can have all kinds of different channels. You could... I know somebody who is a therapist who has a practice as a therapist and has an online presence doing that and also sells her work. So yeah, it just depends on what the other company is. You just have to have a separate website for it. And yes, Samara, I ship my paintings without frames. Um, yes, Carolyn, you can get both sides of your brain working. Awesome. And Claire says, see more and more opportunities that promote art and science together. Awesome. And when that ping happens, Sue, um, what that is, is the, the um, notification from PayPal that you've had a purchase. And if it pings, you just do the happy ping dance. Absolutely do the happy ping dance. Um, PayPal has business accounts and you can link it to your bank account. It's better to have it linked to a business bank account, but you can set up a business PayPal account. It won't cost you a thing. It's cheap. Claire, I can't talk about Fine Art America. I, I just don't feel comfortable talking about it and expressing what my reservations are. Uh, I think that there are an awful lot of people out there online who've already expressed it really eloquently. So if you just do a search for that, I think you'll find what the issues are. Um, yes, there's a standard shipping process. It's a little bit different for everybody, Camille. So it depends on how much or how little you're putting into the shipping and the packaging. 
but you definitely have to package and the the painting up so that it's not going to get damaged and then if you have a standard system for doing it it's so much easier then you can pass it off to somebody else to do it for you patricia says i have some paintings on fine art america they sell prints at various sizes and various materials i've sold one so far do you have any feelings about the site yeah i do i'm not a fan but that's as much as i'm i want to go into on that um i think faso is a better platform than than that um yeah just do a little search and i think you'll find why um francesca puts on a really good point here she says people may not remember what you say but they will will remember how you made them feel that is spot on leslie says haha we use bless your heart here too <laughs> yes it's not a positive thing at all um y'all feel free to use bless your heart anytime you want to just remember it's not a not a nice thing it's a polite way of telling somebody to to take a hike i definitely have a refund policy i think a no refund policy is going to hamper your sales and i don't think it's good for the customers they might change their mind i've had one person change their mind about a painting once they got it and she sent it back for a different one one person in almost 10 years of selling online so you don't get a whole lot of refunds when people are not afraid of what will happen if they don't like the painting if they know that they can send it back there are not as many people who are going to do it it's just like zappos one of the reasons zappos was so successful as an online shoe store I mean, think about how hard it is to sell shoes online people can't try them on first but when they know they can send them back if they don't work that alleviates a problem and people become more comfortable doing it so I, i'm opposed to a no refund policy on everything i feel pretty strongly about that um, it doesn't happen very often you have to think about how you want your customers to feel and i have colleagues online who have courses in other arenas i know some on in art too who have a no refund policy and i think that stinks because if somebody gets in and realizes they've made a mistake they have no way out they're going to hesitate to even buy to begin with and then i know people who make people jump through an enormous number of hoops in order to get a refund that's just bad karma it'll bite you it'll come back and get you and it may not happen today may not happen tomorrow but it's it sends a message to your customer that you're not you're afraid of how they're going to feel and that you don't have confidence in your work. So I know it's scary to put out a refund policy, but I think it's crucial whether you're selling work through a gallery or whether you're selling it through online. And I don't know of a retail business alive that doesn't have some sort of return policy. If they do, don't, they don't last real long. So um i would get a refund policy going yeah paypal pings when you sell if you have the notification turned on it's the only one that i have the the alert turned on because i like to hear it so your policy could be anything it could be 10 days two weeks a month it could be three days it could be whatever but have some sort of refund policy absolutely some sort um yes i finished the edges yeah, sally all the edges on my paintings are finished becky from facebook says i've been finding if i share my drawings on facebook on pages or my art page it's not seen have you found that no i haven't um your art your art on your business page your business profile and you need a business page on facebook and a business profile on instagram because it's a violation of the terms of service of Facebook to promote your artwork for sale on your personal profile. You can lose your whole account. Um, you have to get an active page. You can't just post it and hope people come by because they won't. So you've got to engage with the people who do come by. 
And there's a system for doing that that works super well. Again, we're going to talk about audience and traffic on Friday. So I'm not putting off your question, but I don't want to go over the same thing I'm going to go over on Friday now. But yes, you can build enough engagement on your Facebook page so that people will see your stuff. Just, when was that? Thursday of last week. I posted actually while I was painting, I was on the beach. So where I'm painting right now, one of the places I've been painting is on the Tybee Island on the South beach, the South end of the Island. So I was on the beach with my daughter and my granddaughter. They were watching and walking and I was painting and I posted a progress shot, a progress video of an image on Instagram stories about what I was doing. And while I was making that post, I got a text from my dealer in another city saying he'd sold nine paintings all while I'm on the beach. And then I got a message from one of my followers on Instagram who'd seen the post of the painting. And she said, do you sell your paintings? I said, yes, actually I do. So yes, people will see your stuff but it comes from posting frequently. If you only post occasionally, people are not gonna see it because the algorithm doesn't share your, your posts when you only post occasionally. So you gotta post on a regular basis. It's just like showing up to paint, you gotta show up to post. Um, so yeah, I sell, I get clients directly off of Instagram who are not on my email list yet. Who well, I have to say, send me an email. So you absolutely will. Um, Patricia says, I have some paintings on, yeah, I've just answered that one. Um, yeah, when you have a framed piece and an unframed piece, Sue, you have to deduct the cost of the frame for the unframed piece. So on my pricing sheet, I have the prices unframed. And then when I include the frame, when I'm showing them in the gallery, I add that to the cost of the piece. So yeah, I have the frame price and the unframed price. And I know how much that frame costs and I mark it up appropriately. So you have to have the same consistent price across all platforms. Yes, Claire, you nailed it. Paint what you love and how you love to paint it. Work hard to get better and it's as simple as that. Mary Jane says, what about prints of digital art? What to call those? They are still original art you're making it on with a tool and you know, David Hockney uses his iPhone to make his paintings and they're spectacular. They're still individual works of art. Those are originals. That's not a reproduction. It's not a copy of an original piece. It is the original piece. I would do limited runs of those original pieces. I might do, it's like an etching or an intaglia or a lithograph. I would do, whatever it is, 10, 20, 50 that you decide, and then not print anymore because it makes the value of the piece more. But digital art is a perfectly valid art form. And I've seen some spectacular work done in it. So I wouldn't worry about that at all. What I would call them is an original art in a limited numbered edition. And when I offer prints for sale, G Clay is just inkjet. It's an inkjet print with archival ink. And Giclee is a word that people like to put on there because it sounds more fancy. Um, your HP printer could have archival ink in it and it would be producing an, a Giclee. It's just the archival quality that makes it a Giclee. So yeah, I if, unless you're selling it as a poster, I think it's important to sell a reproduction that's gonna be archival. Question from Kathy on Facebook. Could you talk about shipping art, how to package it, and what's the most affordable way? Just did that. So I think I talked about that just a few minutes ago. Um, whether you decide to sell reproductions, it's really up to the person. I very rarely do because I license my work to a publishing company. Not all of my paintings, but a, a handful. I limit how many of my pieces are in reproduction. 
and for the moment at least I'm not doing any reproductions I've done a few in the past and I do them as posters rather than as prints so that's my solution everybody has to have their own solution I want to be really careful that there are not so many reproductions out there that it diminishes the value of my original paintings um, the licensing company that I work with makes reproductions for hospitals, doctor's offices, um, hotels, Macy's, Pottery Barn, places like that. And, but they've only got a small number of my paintings and those are not ones that I sell any reproductions of. I tend to use the small daily paintings for that. They did want to make a big reproduction of a large painting that I did and it sold to a, one of my main collectors. And I wouldn't let them do it because they wanted to put it in a hotel in the same town as my collector was in. And I think he would have been understandably angry to go into dinner in a hotel restaurant and run into a large copy of the painting that he just spent thousands of dollars on. So you have to be careful with that. Be really, really careful with that. Susan says, my grandson loves to paint. Is there anything out there to help kids get started in artwork or just let them do whatever they want? The best thing to do for a child who loves to paint is to give them the materials, the space, and the time to do it. That's what my mother did for me. She had really strong feelings about it, and her mother, who was also an artist, did as, as well. Um, Mom gave me crayons and paper when I was teeny to paint and draw with. She let me use her watercolors as soon as I was old enough to really hold a brush. And she always bought materials when I wanted them. So we had plenty of space and place to make art growing up. It was just a natural part of what we did. That's the best thing that you can do. Give them the materials. Um, let's see, Sue, it just takes me a while to get all the answer, get to the questions. There are literally hundreds of questions in here. So if you have to leave, don't worry, I'm going to get the questions, but you may have to listen to the answer in the recording. Um, yes, Sandra, there's a market for unframed art. Online, all of mine that I sell online is unframed. Absolutely. Jennifer, this is a really, really important issue. Jennifer says, and it's one of the things that holds people back from selling online or showing their work online. She says, what about the issue of people copying your style? I, I think the bigger issue is what about people copying your actual paintings? And I've had that happen. People are going to copy your style. There are a lot of different styles. And, and they're, even if they try to copy your style, they can't be you. Copying your style in a different subject is just going to happen. I would let that go. They're still not going to be you. They're not going to have your email list. They're not going to have your access to your traffic. They're not going to have your audience. They won't be successful. Plus, it's bad karma, and it'll bite them in the end. Um, what is a bigger issue is when people copy your actual individual paintings. And there are ways to deal with that. I've had it happen more than once. I got an Instagram one Sunday morning, and I hardly ever just scroll through Instagram. I use it for the business, but I'm not a glued to my screen person. I was just randomly scrolling through while I was drinking my coffee, and I saw paintings that looked just like mine. And it was from somebody. It was when I first started my Instagram account. I didn't have that many followers. This person had followed me and I'd followed them back because it was early days of Instagram, of my Instagram. And she had the audacity to post copies she had made of my paintings on Instagram. So we had a little conversation and a few very choice words and I made her take them down. I made her take her off her website, made, them take, made her take them off of social media because that was illegal. She was infringing on my copyright. You have to enforce that. But there are tools online to find that. You can find it through a Google reverse search. And I found the others that way as well. And in the end, yeah, there are going to be some ripoff companies um, that will copy your stuff and sell prints. But again, they don't have access to your audience, your platform, your email list. That's why that platform is so important. In the end, they can't really hurt you. They can frustrate you. They can drive you crazy. 
but you can't spend all your time or energy there. Or you'll never get any paintings done. You'll never meet the needs of your audience. You won't serve anyone. And if you never show your work, you definitely won't serve anyone. So you have to kind of let a lot of that go. Just do your due diligence and let it go. Let it go. Um, yes, as Claire says, don't worry about it. There's only one of you. Chase it down when you find it. When it's in your face, you have to address it because the law says if you ignore people who copy your work when you find it, then you're relinquishing your copyright. That's true in the States. I'm not sure about other places. So you have to address it when it happens and you find out about it, but you don't stay up all night worrying about it. I do a search maybe once a month, every other month, looking for that kind of stuff. Um, and yes, Kathleen FASA will help you in getting all of that stuff with your domain. And if you're selling reproductions, I would number them. It makes people feel like there's more value there. Um, Elaine says, I have a website for my illustration with my name.com. Should I rename it Elaine Illustration and create a new one? No, um, I probably would keep both the illustration and the paintings on there. If your illustrations feed your paintings, which feed your illustrations, I don't think there's anything wrong with having a section of your website that is for illustration and a section that's for your fine art, for your paintings. So I would not do that. Um, Susan, you will have a crash experience. Absolutely. And Weebly and Wix are okay to get started. I think they're problematic and they charge more than FASO. That's my feeling about Weebly and Wix. And yes, if you pay the annual with FASO, you save a lot of money. Um, Sally, will I be posting this again? Yeah, the replay will be up on the directory page after we get off. It takes a couple of hours for us to process the video and get it uploaded, but it'll be up there very soon. Um, Tony from Facebook says, does FASO have a tool to put a watermark to protect the paintings? Yeah, I think they do. I actually do not recommend watermarks because watermarks don't protect your paintings. Watermarks are easily removed by anybody with Photoshop. And the per person who has the problem from the watermark is your potential collector. So it's been my observation, and it's my feeling, that it doesn't do a single thing to deter the copyist. It doesn't deter people who copyright infringe, but it can get in the way of your potential customer getting a really good look at that painting and being willing to spend the money for something they haven't seen in person. So you have to weigh the pros and cons. But yes, FASA does have a, a watermark tool. And you can pay monthly or yearly. Yearly is less. Yes, and if you know a FASO user, you can ask them for a recommendation and then you both get a free month. Um, yeah, and FASO told me that too, but I don't have one, so that's one of the reasons. It's um, eh. um, But yes, if you have a friend that has one, you can both end up with a free month. You can get the whole year paid if you get enough people in there. Um, Stephanie says, question from Kaj. I have mine on Artspan. Wondering if I should change. Artspan's okay. I don't, I'm not that familiar with, it feels, here's my impression, and I could be totally wrong about this. Like I said, I don't, I'm not as familiar with it. But to me, Artspan has always felt like having a website on Saatchi or Artsy. Those are commercial sales platforms and they're trying to sell so that they get their cut and their commission. Um, it's not the same as having your own website. So I don't think Artspan is the same as like Art Storefront or FASO, but I'll check on that and share that in the group, what I find out about that. I'm, I'm more than willing to say, I don't know the answer to that one. Um, Susan, I think having a name that's so unique is really wonderful and I would not hesitate to use that as your domain name. And she says, I thought it would be hard, but it is doing very nicely as my identity. Yeah. It's just like my putting my whole name on there, which I do on Facebook, Mary Bentz Gilkerson does really well for me and it's a little unique. 
but um, it just depends. Live into it. Uh, Cheryl says, I'm just doing the free route at Weebly, no shopping cart yet. When you get ready to go to the paid route, I would look at switching to something like Art Storefront or FASA. And Patricia says, the biggest mistake, mistake people make is not using their actual name for Instagram or other social sites. Who remembers 123 Vanilla? That is one huge mistake. I totally agree. It's the same as using My Cute Pink Ponies as your website name. You need to have your name as your handle for your website, your social media hub, all of that stuff. And yes, you can... Um, Susan, it depends on where your napkin writer blog is. And I would talk to FASO support about that because I'm not sure what platform you've got that on. Samara says, I use three different mediums. Should I have only one medium displayed on the website? Nope. As long as there is a consistent body of work or moving in that direction, all of them can be on there. I've got multiple mediums on mine. Jan, direct sales means that there's no gatekeeper. It means that somebody buys directly from you. It means that they're not having to go to a dealer, a gallerist, or another online platform to make a purchase. Um, Barbara says, I'm divorced but kept my married name. I've been using my maiden name with old married name behind it. Is that okay? Absolutely. Totally. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. It helps to differentiate you. I have not used Zelle, Jackie. I don't know anything about it. Camille says, is it possible to sell via Amazon? Um, Amazon opened to selling art about 10 years ago. Now, God, it's hard to believe it's been that long. Um, and originally, they only let approved galleries sell art on Amazon. And I'm not sure what the status of that is now, but I will definitely look into that. Um, again, Amazon would be like, selling on Amazon would be like selling on Etsy. It's somebody else's platform and they're gonna take a percentage of what you sell. So it's not selling off your own platform. So I would not recommend it to start with, if indeed you can do it. Um, maybe down the road, but not to begin with, for sure. Um, Samara, you can limit your shipping, your sales to just the US. If you're in the States, you can limit, you can say that sales are, and shipping is only available within the, the continental US. You can put that on your website. And Gal whoever the Galaxy Note 5 is, Directing traffic to your website, that's that traffic and audience thing that we're going to be talking about on Friday. And shipping is based on size and weight. Sales is, a lot of times we think we're horrible at sales because we think sales is some magical formula where you go up and try to sell a car um, by convincing somebody that they should buy that car. What you're selling is an experience. And if you build a relationship first, then you don't even really have to ask for the sale. So you don't have to worry about that. It doesn't have to be nasty or, or difficult. And Bonnie McCarty from Facebook asked, what do you put in the email? And I already answered that one. Sorry, it's taking so long for me to get, I'm getting these messages about an hour after people post them, but so half the time I've already sold them. Um, I already answered them. Susie says, when I was selling Mary Kay and Border Collie puppies, I had fraudulent emails to purchase product or pups from overseas. I probably won't be selling to overseas people. Um, that is definitely a choice that you can make. And there, there are times when there are fraudulent emails for sure. So I don't send the painting until the payment via PayPal or Stripe has cleared. Then I ship the painting. So I, I, I know what you're talking about. The, the tools are there now to really handle the fraudulent accounts. And that's one of the reasons I like using PayPal. PayPal has uh, protection for the seller and for the buyer so that you're protected from those fraudulent emails. The, Chris, the blog and the email can be the same thing. That's the magic. 
um, the blog and the email can be the exact same thing. It just goes in two different places. Deborah says, if I can't put my show schedule in my emails, where should that go? Many of my customers come to see me at a show because they got the info in an email. Now, if you're selling at live events, that's a different thing, Deborah. That's not like I won first place in the so-and-so guild show last month. That's what I'm talking about with showing. If you've got a promotion, an event where you're going to be selling coming up, that definitely needs to go in an email but I would devote one email to one show and you can send out a schedule for the quarter so that people can plan. But that would be one email that would have that. And you could send people straight to your website for that information too. But that's one promotional email. I would not make that part of a newsletter. Um, so that's a little bit different than what I was talking about earlier. Um, Oh, Casey, you cracked me up doing some fine work and even on cloudy, misty days. Sally says, am I able to see this recording again? Yes, you can. It will be up later today. And from Barbara, what is segmentation? Segmentation is when you group similar interests on your email list together. It's a, an advanced technique. It's not for people to do when they're starting out. You don't need to worry about it. It's what you do when you're down the road and you've got enough subscribers that people are interested in different things. You don't need to worry about it when you're just getting started, but it's just creating a small subset of your email list and sending just them a certain thing. Sorry, I'm losing my voice. Deanna says, do you have an email example to get an idea? If you're on my email list, you've gotten several of them. So I think you've probably already gotten one. Go look at some emails from me. That's an example. They're short, usually pretty short. And if you're on my email list for my paintings, look, look on there. That's what I'm talking about. They're really short. They're not super long. So take a look there. And, and Sue, no, all sales are not final. I absolutely advocate having a refund policy. Um. What he talked about stretched and unstretched. The return cost, it, you, it, I usually pay for shipping going out and if they're returning, they pay for the shipping coming back and if they pick out a new painting, I pay, pay for the shipping going back the other way. So return postage, they pay for. Just like if you order clothes from such and such and you send it back. Usually you have to pay for the shipping. Not always, depends. Um, so no, I do, I'm not familiar with Zelle at all. So I can't say whether it's good or not. Um, Sue, it's over. I know you've already had to leave. It's over when I get through the questions, but I'm gonna have to call it off in just a few minutes because we've been on for over two hours already. Um, yeah, Casey agrees with me about that. So Casey can address that. And I'll let her address that in the free Facebook group. I think we've talked about it in there before. And yes, Artwork Archive is a system for inventorying your artwork. And I inventory mine in my shopping cart so that I'm not putting it in 14 different places. Artwork Archive works. And I used to use something similar a long time ago. Um, I had a database that was standalone on my computer and there's one called GIST, which is um, another inventory program. The problem with any of those is if you have too many places to put all of the info about your paintings, you'll never put any info in there. And the one that works is the one you use. So I have a standard operating procedure of entering the painting into my shopping cart as soon as I finish it. And I've done it for so many years that way, it's autopilot, I don't have to think about it. And it goes into one place, I have it backed up, and it doesn't matter whether I'm selling it today, tomorrow, or next year, it's in the system. So one of them works. 
but whichever one you use. Um, Yvonne, Etsy, I talked about that last time. So go listen to the first session, but I talked about Etsy in detail. Etsy is not your own platform. It can, your shop can disappear overnight. I know people that happen to. Um, so you have to spend the same amount of energy driving traffic to Etsy as driving to your own site. So you might as well drive it to your own site. Elaine says, what about the term fine art? Who can use this term? Anybody who types it in on their computer and you don't have to have a certain quality to your work. There's no, there's no board that monitors that. And if you want to use that is that your name, fineart.com, go for it. It, you get to decide whether your work is fine art and whether you're an artist, nobody else. Um, yes, Ginger's talking about the differences in bless your heart. Yeah, there's a, there are different ways to phrase it, but it's never really a good thing. Usually if it's, it's not sending them someplace, it's like, oh, I think you're pathetic. Um, yes, I have been scanned. Uh, I've had people attempt to scam me. The only time I got scammed was when I was fresh out of college and I had somebody who commissioned a painting and then disappeared with the painting. Um, so yeah, I've had that. I've had dealers that were gallerists that were less than ethical and never pay me for paintings. So I've been scammed that way, but I've never been scammed through online sales. No, because I use PayPal for the payments for my paintings and they've got seller protection. So no. Um, and as Claire says, talking about returns, I love this. Claire said that I've had one return. The wife didn't like it. Then they bought a larger one. Exactly. When people know they can bring it back, it makes them feel comfortable and they're more likely to purchase. Um, and yes, the customer, I have the customer pay the shipping. Oh, that's about refunds. We talked about that ad nauseum. Um, I have the customer pay shipping so that I can discount the shipping if I want to in a special promotion. I never discount the paint, almost never discount the paintings. Um, yeah, we've covered all the buyer return stuff a lot. Yeah, and, and Susan is backing up the, the having a refund policy. She says, we owned a fitness franchise that set up business on a one-year basis, paid for monthly, but headquarters would not let us let our members out when it was right for them in shorter time than a year. And it's very lasting bad karma. In the end, the owner of the franchise paid dearly for what had started as a happy, supportive business and personal relationship. I agree, totally. It, you have to make things right for your customers. Deanna Woods from Facebook says, does anyone find making prints of oil paintings to sell good? Yes, there are people who do that. And like I said, I license my work. Um, it's not a huge income stream, but it's definitely a regular income stream. So yeah, reproductions can pay. Jennifer from Facebook asks, would you ship pastel paintings? Yes, I would and have. If so, any tips or resources? Um, when you're shipping pastels, you want to ship them flat. Definitely do not ever roll them. And they are going to be better off at least matted and acetated. Well, not acetate because that'll pull the pastel off. Pastels works on paper like that are some of the few that I, I might frame first, but not use glass in the framing but I definitely would mat it because it'll protect it. And then you've got to reinforce that with foam core so it's not gonna get all torn up. Christine says, PayPal takes, takes a percentage, so how do you refund without losing money? They cover that. And any payment gateway you use is gonna take a percentage. It's called the cost of doing business. All of them take somewhere right around 3%, which is less than a bank would take. If you did a credit card through service through a bank, 
So yeah, all of them are going to take a percentage. It's somewhere around between 2.7 and 2.9%. And it is just what you pay for having them give you seller protection and for doing the money transfer. So it is money well spent. And if somebody refunds, they get that money back. So um, PayPal handles that pretty evenly. So I wouldn't let that be a, a anything that would hold me back. Jennifer says, can you speak to Amazon Handmade and thoughts on it for sales? Amazon Handmade is the same as Etsy. No, not for beginning. It could be a channel down the road, but it's somebody else's platform. Don't go there. Definitely don't go there. Um, they're just trying to, Amazon started Amazon Handmade to compete with Etsy. That was after they started tried to compete with online galleries like um, Artsy and Saatchi Art. And I don't think they did a very good job of it. Um, so no, you've still got to drive traffic to it and you have to pay them a percentage. They own the platform. Yes, I have business cards, Sally. I've had the same business cards for six years now, the same order. I don't use them very often. Every now and then, once in a blue moon, somebody asks for one. But I ordered 500 six years ago, and I probably still have a good 300. So they're good to have, but you don't have to have them. I wouldn't spend two weeks on them for sure. And you just want your name, phone number, email, and website, all of that, all your contact info. Elaine says, I created my business Facebook page prior to my Instagram page. Now my Instagram business page wants me to make a Facebook business page for me. I can't get it to link to the Facebook business page I'd previous, I had made previously. Um, I don't, it sounds like either your business page is dormant or there's a glitch in the system. So um, I really can't speak to what's going on there, Elaine, but I think if you um, go and make some posts on that, Facebook business page so that it's active. Also, if you haven't made it live yet, Instagram isn't going to know it exists. So you have to publish the business page and make it go live before Instagram can recognize it. Um, and yes, as Carson says, if you're making a business card, get your art on there as well. And Teresa says, I don't understand stories yet on Instagram and Facebook. It took me a while to get them too. Um, they're really informal. I'm going to talk, that's my secret sauce that I'm going to talk about on driving traffic on Friday. They're pretty cool. I can't go into too much depth because we're only going to have, try to keep the presentation to an hour. Um, we don't have a, a, a full month to go on there. I could teach about Instagram and have taught about Instagram for a whole month. Um, but yes, yeah, stories work super well. Stories are just short little video clips, basically. Um, Elaine says, I have too many Facebook pages now due to false starts with Instagram. Is there a way to take it down? Yeah, you can go into your, go to your personal profile and you can delete pages that you don't want to keep. You can absolutely delete them. Just get rid of them. Um, Casey says, yeah, that it, the original print thing is muddy. Um, original prints are original when they are etchings and intaglios and lithographs and they are handmade. And there's a huge big difference between that and a reproduction. So again, I could wax poetic about that for an entire afternoon. I'll do that at some point. Um, and everything should be a limited run. No, a clay is not original art. No, definitely, Sally. A clay is not considered original art. It is a reproduction. It is a copy of original art. It is not an original. So and it, it, you can't sell a clay as an original. The only time it's an original is if you have a digital painting or a digital photograph that you're printing out. 
So Elaine, if you have multiple pages, just delete the ones you don't want to use. And you're going to have to go reactivate that page. It sounds like it's gone dormant or you haven't published it yet. And yeah, Sherry, I know when you sell a painting, yeah, Sherry's asking a really good question. When you sell a painting, do you keep the rights of it to it for future prints? Yes, you do. When you sell a painting, you're selling the painting, not the copyright to the image. So you can make reproductions of that later if you want to. But keep in mind, you don't want to make a big old giant copy of it and hang it in a restaurant where your client who bought it is going to walk through the door. That's tacky. Um, but yeah, you can definitely make it. Um, you can make prints from it in the future. And there's definitely a way to link Instagram to an existing business page. But again, Elaine, I think the problem is that your page is not published or it's gone dormant. Um, yeah, the copyist on Instagram, it, some people are just jerks. Yes. Thank you, Chris. Chris posted the link on how to connect to Instagram to the particular page. I think she's got the Chris, I think she's done that, but it, she's just having an issue with some stuff. Um, yes, there's a Facebook page with who stole my images. But I wouldn't recommend going there really often because she'll begin worrying about it too much. Yeah, you don't want, you want a business Instagram account and a business Facebook page, and then you want to connect them together. That's really important. Um, I would create the Facebook business page first and then create the Instagram business account. And Elaine, I, I don't think we can do that from within the webinar. Um, my advice would be go to the Facebook page, activate the one you want to keep, link that to Instagram, and then worry about deleting the others later. They're not sub pages, they're business pages. Um, Stephanie says, a question from Linda. What if the artist's art is both imaginary plus more realistic for portraiture? How might both styles be displayed on one's website? Get one going first, it's that plates thing again, and get that one going and sustaining and then start the other one. You just have two different drop downs in the menu. Um, Chris, I wouldn't worry about the spelling. Nobody can spell my name either. How do you think you spell Gilkerson? Nobody spells it, but people find me because they start typing it in and Google finishes it off. Magic. So Google anticipates what it's supposed to look like. And if they misspell it, Google says, did you mean to search for and puts in the right one? So don't worry about that so much. It will take, take care of it. One o'clock, Sally, same time, same back cave. No, I do not offer occasional discounts for my paintings tomorrow. The only way that people get a discount on my paintings is when they buy more than one at a time. So if somebody buys nine paintings at one time, they get a slight discount. They get 10% off. If somebody buys 35, which they've done, then they get a bigger discount. And it was actually the same collector who did both but you don't discount your paintings otherwise. I discount the shipping, but I don't discount the paintings in, a, in general, only if they're buying multiples. Um, yeah, if you're not completing a painting a week, you can talk about a part of a painting or the inspiration for the painting. You can talk about the same painting for the whole month. You could talk about different aspects of a painting. So there's lots of stuff. Susan, your work is copyrighted as soon as it's finished. You do not have to submit the copyright forms. If you want to, then you go to the Library of Congress and download the copyright form to submit it. It's all you have to do. Awesome. Yeah, Zelle is bank to bank transfer, but I don't think it's for public sales, as, as Patricia says. I, I don't think that's something that 
anybody's going to feel comfortable about because they won't have heard about it. So I would use PayPal and shopping cart. I thought was for customer only. We'll have to investigate. Shopping carts, yeah, they're for customers. The customer needs the shopping cart to purchase. You need the shopping cart to link to the payment gateway. So PayPal has a really simple one you can use for free, or you can use WooCommerce, which is also free. FASO includes the shopping cart, but shopping cart is how people input their name and address and enter their credit card information to go through PayPal so that you can send them the painting. You gotta have a shopping cart. Barbara says, is it okay to save a photo of someone else's artwork just to study it later? Um, I would pin it to a Pinterest board. I would not download it because it's not okay to copy anybody's work and whether you're going to sell it or not. That violates copyright law and it's too easy to forget where the image came from. So pin it to a Pinterest board if you want to look at it again later and analyze it. But I wouldn't download copies of people's work. I just wouldn't do that. It's too easy to go wrong unintentionally. Um, I licensed my paintings through a publishing company that came to me because of finding me on the web because I posted so much. Um, so that's why I'm talking about you need an online presence. By posting on a regular basis and by showing up on social media, they found my website and then they came to me. There are other ways to do it. You can make proposals to the different um, publishing companies. But I wouldn't do that until you have a consistent body of work. It's not the first thing you do. You get the website up and you start posting and selling and building an audience first. I do not have a shipping app, Carolyn. I use um, the U.S. Postal Service flat rate shipping, and it's based on size, how much you can fit in a box. You don't have to have an app for that. I have an account with them, so if I'm getting ready to ship something, I type in that I'm, I need a medium box, and I print the shipping label out. I take the box off the shelf, pack the painting up, and send it off. If it's a big painting, I take it to the UPS store and get them to build a box for the painting and ship it that way. But I don't use an app for it. Either way, you're not sitting there having to count, calculate the um, weight and shipping. You do it by size. <coughs> yeah, framing pastels with Plexi can pull the pastel off too. I know, um, Michelle, it is an issue. So I think the... There's no good simple solution for shipping pastels other than shipping them flat and having, um, they, they make a paper that is archival, that's really thin and has a waxed surface so it doesn't attract the particles. It's what I use between my monotypes when I'm storing and my works on paper when I'm storing them. And it, I can't remember what it's called right now, or I'd say it. But if you put, if you mat and mat the piece and put the paper over it and then package it up and put it inside plastic, that's going to protect it without pulling the dust off of the pastel. Yeah, it is a big, huge issue. I used to do a lot of pastels. Um, Samara says, what do you think of prints ordered from Snapfish or Shutterfly? No, those are not good to sell. Um, their quality is up and down and all over the place. It's really more for personal family photos. If you're going to sell prints on acid-free paper, I would go to something like Printful or Zazzle or a site that actually specializes in printing artwork. So I would not use Shutterfly or Snapfish for that. Chris says, I ship pastels often. You can ship in a cheap pop-on Walmart frame. And it's worked by crisscrossing the tape across the glass. That's awesome. See, this is called crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing information. Question from Teresa. I'm going to take until 4 o'clock. I think I can get through all the questions then. But. Make sure your questions are right on the topic of what we talked about today. 
Um, and because I am going to have to stop at four. I think I'm almost at the end. So I want to make sure we can get as many of these as possible. Um, Teresa says, what kind of price would you charge for a G clay in relationship to the original? Um, you have to look at what others at the same price and size are selling for. And I don't sell G clays. I license my work instead. So that's not something I do that often. Um, but it's in general, what I tell my students to do, because I do have some students who are doing that, is take the cost of the G clay and multiply it by two to three times. So that mark it up two to three times to cover your cost of hosting your website, promoting it, shipping, and handling and all that kind of stuff. So if it costs you $10, charge $20 to $30. So usually three times is a better idea because they're always costs that you don't think about. Um, Stephanie says from Teresa, oh, that was the question I just answered. Awesome. Um, it's awesome, Karen, if you can do a certificate of provenance when you sell it. I include the invoice, but I do not do the certificate right now. One of my students does. In fact, Teresa's created, I don't, Teresa Edwards, I don't know if you're on right now or not, but Teresa created this beautiful certificate that she includes with her paintings. And I've told, thank you, Chris, glassing, duh. Um, that was the paper, I couldn't remember. I was having a brain fart on. Um, so Teresa created a, a template for that, that she prints out when she sells a painting. And I think it can add to the customer experience so that when they unbox it, they see this beautiful package and a nice little certificate. But if that is more than you can get done right now, let it go, do it later. So I don't think it's a requirement, but I think it's really nice when you can, when you've got the bandwidth to do it. Yeah, and as Chris says, also ship pastels and clear bags. I use clear bags too for all of my works on paper because they're archival. Put on foam core mat, glassine, wrap them, and put them in a clear bag. Awesome. And congratulate the buyer. Make a sold post on Facebook. Yes. Yeah. Mary Jane says, should digitals be priced like original? Only if they are an original work of art. If they are reproductions, no. If it's a digital painting, a digital photograph, yeah, it is an original. So, yeah, and Mary Jane, I know you do photo, digital photography too. So, yeah, that's an original. Um, works on paper, you can't charge as much for as you can um, works that are already on gallery rack frames or um, stretchers or panels. And the reason for that is that those are ready to hang on the wall and works on paper have the added cost of framing. So I tend to charge a little bit less for works on paper. So there's room in there for the frame cost. So I think that's all the questions. We got through them all. So thank you all for being here. It's been fantastic talking with you. Just want to remind you, what we're going to cover on Friday and then on Monday. Friday is audience and traffic. On Monday, we're covering sales mechanism. So remember, pricing is a sales mechanism issue. We'll talk about pricing a little bit. We can't go into a whole lot of detail on it. So we're not going to go through a whole big long um, lesson on pricing because we just don't have the bandwidth for that. But we will talk about it in real general terms on Monday. Audience and traffic on Friday, sales mechanism on Monday. Y'all have a great rest of the week. Happy painting, everybody. And I will be sending out the replay link and the link to the Facebook group shortly. Take care. Bye-bye for now.